Okay, so let us carry on where we left off. So we were looking at these famous six recollections, Anusatis, and that you find in a number of places in the suttas. And uh, this particular sutta we're looking at is one of those places, the uh, numerical discourse is the sixth is sutta number 10. And we have looked in uh, quite a bit of detail at the uh, idea of the recollection of the Buddha, uh, what that means. Uh, and of course from the Buddha, once you have the awakening in the world and the Dhamma kind of proceeds from that, it is uh, kind of just the verbal expression of that insight of the Buddha. Uh, and then uh, from that, from the Dhamma, comes then the Sangha, the Sangha being the uh, noble disciples, uh, the other people who have the same kind of insight. Uh, and then after that comes like the training or the practical aspects of the path, uh, because that training really arises with the arising of the Sangha. And um, that is it's quite a nice uh, little story. It's, not, it's, it's a part of the... Uh, uh, Dhamma Chakka Pavattana Sutta, the set, uh, setting in motion of the wheel of the Dhamma, and uh, being the first Buddha's first discourse, maybe a collection of his first discourses, maybe, that's what seems to be the case. And uh, he teaches the, first, the five disciples, uh, the first five people, uh, the five uh, men that were looking after him uh, when he was doing his ascetic practices uh, and then he decides after his awakening he's going to try to teach them because they were very helpful to him uh, and he decides that he will help those who have been helpful to him uh, which is kind of nice, yeah? it's a nice little touch, this is the Buddha and he, uh, gratitude is kind of at the front of his mind at this point uh, they have helped him, uh, he achieved awakening uh, and now he is going to help them back yeah, in return uh, so he seeks them out and he goes, goes to uh, Varanasi, to the uh, Saranat, the deer park. Yeah. And uh, you can go there in the present day, it's quite a nice place to go. Yeah. And then he teaches them. Yeah. And then uh, uh, one of the five disciples, Kondanya, he actually sees the Dhamma, he becomes a stream enter. Yeah. And then the Buddha kind of exclaims, Wow! Ahuvatabo Kondanyo Anyasi, or something like that. Vatabo. Anyasi Vatabo Kondanyo, that's right, Anyasi Vatabo Kondanyo. And Vatabo is like, wow, indeed, amazing, yeah, something like that. Uh, Kondanya understands, uh, right? Uh, Anyasi means like understand. Kondanyo is the name of the person. Uh, and it's obviously that the Buddha is almost surprised, yeah, that someone can really get this, yeah, just from listening to a discourse and practicing in the right way. Uh, and the Eye of the Dhamma, the Dhamma Chakku, uh, opens up. You see that reality in the same way as the Buddha, as a consequence of someone else teaching, uh, teaching him or teaching them. Uh. And this later on becomes known as the uh, Anusasana Patihariya. Uh, and Patihariya is like sometimes translated as, translated as a miracle, uh, but I think it would be better to translate it as a marvel or a wonder. Uh. Um, and it's a marvel or wonder of teaching, the fact that you teach someone else uh, and they are capable to make the same kind of breakthrough into something so profound as non-self and giving up all attachments in the world, these kind of things. Uh, and even the Buddha is surprised when it happens the first time. Anyasi Vatabo Kondanyo, Anyasi Vatabo Kondanyo is the expression of the Dhammashaka Pavatana Sutta. And so, because of that, then he realized that training actually works. Uh, yeah, it is possible to teach others. And then the training kind of comes into existence at that point. Uh, and this is then here um, uh, spoken about in terms of the sila and then the terms of generosity. Uh, and then at the very end comes an additional uh, recollection, which is the recollection of the devatas or the kind of gods. Uh, so now let us move on to the uh, recollection of the Dhamma, the Dhamma Nusati. Uh, and uh, just quickly, we're going to have to go a little bit faster now, I think. It's, it's, it's Thursday today, is that right? Is it Thursday today? Wow, okay. So tomorrow, Saturday morning, we'll have a few more sessions left. Uh, so we'll have to speed up dramatically here. Uh, maybe I should speak faster here. Uh, maybe that's the way I get more crammed into a short period. Of <laughs> anyway, let's see what we've got here. Uh, okay. So furthermore, a noble disciple recollects the teaching, the Dhamma. The teaching is well explained by the Buddha, apparent in the present life, immediately effective, inviting inspection, 
relevant uh, so that sensible people can know it for themselves. Uh, okay, when a noble disciple, well, something has happened here, and something bad has happened there. <laughs> Um, when a noble disciple recollects the Dhamma, their mind is not full of greed, hatred, and delusion, etc. The whole sequence comes again, right? Uh, you're just using a different comp object or contemplation, the same sequence happens, you go all the way to Samadhi. Uh, and then you're called a disciple who lives in balance among people who are unbalanced, uh, who lives untroubled among people who are troubled. Uh, they've entered the stream of the teaching uh, and developed the recollection uh, of the teaching. Uh. So this is then the standard way that the Dhamma is uh, recalled in the suttas. Uh, yes, um, Svakato, Bhagavata, Dhammo, Sandittiko, Akaliko, Epasiko, etc. Kind of standard <coughs> verse that is recited in the, around the Theravadan Buddhist world. Uh, and uh, so it starts off by saying that it is well explained by the Buddha, these teachings. Yeah? Svakato. Uh, and... Um, this is kind of, I think, an important word. It's hard to really pin it down. It's not really explained in any details anywhere. The rest that we see here could be called a explanation of that. But uh, I think, yeah, it is more than that. This is an additional quality of the Dhamma rather than just what comes afterwards. Uh, so it's well explained. Uh, you get some ideas in the suttas about what the Buddha means by this. Uh, in some places it says that uh, there is nothing uh, superfluous uh, and nothing missing uh, in the Dhamma. Uh, yeah? In other words, he hasn't said anything that is additional to what is required. Uh, he hasn't veered into philosophy. He has, he's not talking about things that are irrelevant. Uh, yeah? Everything in the Dhamma is uh, needed for the path. Uh, nothing is really superfluous. Uh, Svakato in this way. And of course, that is very significant. Uh, because what that means is that when you have the Noble Eightfold Path, which really is the summary of everything that we have to do on the path, uh, when you have that, you can't really take bits out. Uh, you can't say, oh, maybe this is not really required. Uh, yeah? And you have to really try carefully to understand what they actually mean, these various factors. Uh, there is a tendency in Buddhism that there are things you don't like. Yeah? You say, okay, this is just cultural baggage. But if you, if it is cultural baggage, then it's no longer svakato. If it is well explained, uh, or well understood, and it's realized, the Buddha says everything he tells others is realized, uh, then of course uh, uh, it's going to be relevant. Uh. And so things that sometimes are unpopular in the modern world, things like rebirth, uh, yeah, again, you have to be very careful. Uh, uh, sometimes you throw out everything, you throw out the meaning of the Dhamma, you throw out the baby and everything, uh, in one bang, go, and it's all gone. Uh, and then of course there is no scope anymore for making that progress that we're supposed to do. You destroy the foundations of the path. Uh. So nothing is really superfluous. Uh. But not only is nothing superfluous, uh, nothing is lacking either, according to the Buddha. Yeah, so really, it is sufficient what we find in the suttas. Uh, and we have to be careful to sometimes add things that are not there and kind of think that these are requirements. Sometimes when we add things, uh, Actually, we distort the original teachings. You have to be very careful. Huh? There's a very fine line between interpretation and adding. Huh? Yeah, interpretation, if it is pure interpretation, it means that you are just understanding what the Buddha said. Huh? But uh, at one point, that goes into adding. It's actually very hard to discern sometimes. Huh? And that is our job, to try to discern that difference uh, between uh, interpretation and adding to the suttas. Huh? So, svakato. Svakato also means that it is very, probably, well explained in the sense that it is articulated very well. It is articulated with uh, precise, using very precise expressions and precise words. Uh, I always marveled at the precision of the Pali compared to almost any kind of translation into any language at all. Uh, it is very, the, the, the sentences are usually very short and very, uh, the meaning is often contracted into few, much fewer words that we find in other languages. Uh, part of that is because of the grammar of Pali. It's a very, it makes the language more succinct because of the grammatical structure of Pali. But some of it, I think, is also to do with just the way the Buddha expresses himself with precision. It's svakato, it's well, it's thought out, yeah, carefully. Yeah. 
One of these interesting things that you find in the suttas is where the Buddha decides to go on retreat, right? He disappears all for a while. A part of that retreat, he's supposed to have been on retreat for a number of weeks after his awakening, and then at regular intervals throughout his life. And you wonder, what did the Buddha do on retreat? Well, probably he's blissing out, okay, as part of it. Of course he does that. But uh, I would say part of it is also to reflect on his discovery. Uh, because even though you have an insight into the nature of reality, uh, the words don't come with that insight. The insight is just like a flash, bang, you see, okay, now how am I going to express this? Uh, and that is an entirely different ballgame. What kind of use words are you going to use? Uh, what is the appropriate term? Uh, you have just discovered something that no one has ever discovered before. Uh, it's kind of difficult to explain, right? Because there is no vocabulary for something that no one has ever uh, seen before. Uh, so the words don't even exist. Uh, you, <laughs> you're gonna, you, it's kind of going to be difficult. Uh, so you have to use words that are more or less metaphorical. Yeah? So we use words like liberation or freedom. Uh, they have an ordinary meaning. They gain an entirely new meaning once they apply to this insight into the nature of reality. Uh, and so this is the... Uh, kind of the genius of the Buddha, yeah? this kind of double ability, have the insight, being a spiritually very profound person, and also having the ability to articulate this in a way that is precise, clear, uh, goes to the heart, is also inspiring, has all of these beautiful qualities coming with it. And one of the things that I have always found in my reading of Dhamma, and I sometimes I don't read many kind of popular books about Buddhism anymore, or even books by people who are, you know, maybe gone a long way on the path. Uh, because what I have found is that uh, almost anyone in the world, regardless of how awakened they might be, and of course we have no idea really how awakened they are, uh, the way they express the Dhamma is not as precise or as clear as what you find in the suttas. Uh, in some ways, it may be more inspiring, because when someone writes something and they are a good author and they have the ability to maybe write a bit of poetry, a few verses, and they kind of have some nice stories, it might be very enjoyable to read. But enjoyment is one thing, and precision, spiritual precision, if you like, is something else. These are not the same thing. And so be very careful. It's very easy to get dragged into a story because it's beautiful. Does it have the depth? Does it have the profundity? Does it have the clarity of expression? And I have always found that the suttas are more precise, more clear, more easy to follow than any other writings in Buddhism. In fact, by a large margin, not just a little bit, by a really large margin. Sometimes it takes a little bit of time to kind of get into the way the Buddha expresses himself. But once you get used to it, it is very very svākato, very well explained. So these are some of the ideas of svākato. And again, this means that when you read the suttas, you look at every word, you look at how it is expressed, you know that there's a meaning in everything. Nothing is really too, uh, uh, nothing is random. Yeah? Everything is structured in a certain way. And uh, all of this kind of adds to the interest in the suttas. But, and I should kind of give a little of a, uh, also point out that there is also an, an other side to this. And the other side is that the suttas are two and a half thousand years old. And it means that they are not verbatim the same as they were at the time of the Buddha. It's impossible to keep a text like this verbatim the same for two and a half thousand years. So sometimes there will be things that are maybe not quite right, or something may be missing, has fallen out, or whatever. And uh, then what you have, can do is you can use what uh, people do today, uh, comparative studies and that sort of thing, to kind of find, find out where there may be flaws in the, in the Pali. <coughs> and sometimes there are some fairly obvious flaws, uh, at other times it may not be obvious, a bit more unclear. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, you can take it with a fairly high degree of confidence uh, that what you read in the suttas is well preserved. Uh, it is basically the word of the Buddha. Occasional problems, uh, but they are, if you read generally and broadly, uh, those occasional problems will be kind of drowned out uh, by the vast majority of very uh, useful teachings. All right, so it's svakato, right? Well explained. So you gain a new appreciation of these words once you kind of uh, think of it in this way. Yeah. 
apparent in the present life, uh, sanditika, uh, yeah, immediately effective, uh, akalika, and these two words are basically synonymous in the suttas. Uh, that basically means that you, in this life, you can, um, you can realize these things. Yeah, and of course that is a very important part uh, of Buddhism. Another thing which makes Buddhism so different from other religions uh, is this idea that it is experienceable now. You don't have to wait till after you die, which is often the case for, for some other religions. Uh, and I, I, I may sound like I'm a kind of Buddhist chauvinist sometimes, because I, I kind of say Buddhism is great, and I kind of, sometimes maybe I'm a bit harsh on other religions. And I, I apologize that I don't really want to be harsh on other religions. Uh, but it's just that I have a very powerful sense uh, that Buddhism is really special in the history of world religions. Uh, and sometimes I want to bring that sense out, how it is different. Uh, yeah? And uh, to me that is actually quite important, uh, because if you understand the difference, it means that your commitment to the Buddhist path becomes much stronger. Uh, and sometimes maybe I say things that I shouldn't say in that uh, pursuit of <laughs> making Buddhism special. Uh, and I. Uh, I do apologize for that, because sometimes it's difficult to be 100%, to get everything you say 100% right, and using exactly the right words and things. Uh, so uh, please take it as, uh, as not being, try, not trying to be harsh on the religions. There are lots of wonderful people in other religions. Sometimes the people in other religions are better than the Buddhists, right? That's the reality sometimes. Uh, but when it comes to the um, actual Dhamma, the teaching, uh, it is very unique in the history of the world. Uh. So. Um, and this is one of those things, that it is apparent and immediately effective in this life. You don't have to wait uh, till after you die. And not only is it effective in a theoretical sense, uh, that you may be able to have these insights uh, sometime in the future, yeah, like you may still feel that Nibbana is far away or whatever, uh, but it is also uh, immediately effective in a, very, in a very different way, in a very direct way. Uh, if you apply your mind well, right now, you will experience the effects right now, right here and now. If you suddenly shift your attitude from being yeah, averse to someone to having compassion or loving kindness for somebody, straight away you feel the difference. Uh, yeah, it is not something we do for the future, it is something that we do for the present right here and now. Uh, and there's a beautiful sutta that I usually like to bring out. This is a sutta in the Sangyutta Nikaya. I have to be careful that one. Go too, go too long with these uh, things. Uh, and then in the Sutta, in the Sangyutta, there's a young monk called Samidhi. Uh, and he's kind of a young monk in the prime of life, uh, yeah, kind of black hair and youth, and one of these, one of these ones. Uh, <laughs> and he, um, uh, he has just been bathing, yeah, and he had a bath, and then he kind of standing in one robe and kind of drying himself. Uh, and then this deity comes down. Uh, and this deity obviously must be is, is a female deity. That's kind of what makes it interesting. As a young monk and a female deity, yeah. this kind of sets up uh, sets the scene for for what happens afterwards. It kind of, this is kind of the kind of worldly tension that you might expect. Uh. And then this deity says to this young monk, yeah, "You are young. Yeah. You are in the prime of life. Why are you wasting your time on this ascetic life when you can enjoy sensual pleasures right here and now?" <laughs> This is what she says to this young monk, yeah? and this young monk says, hmm, all right, okay, well, maybe you have a point. Uh, actually, he doesn't say that. He, he said, but it's a, little bit, it's a little bit like that, right? Because it always puts some doubt in your mind, because uh, actually, it's true, isn't it? Uh, the deity says, why are you pursuing all of these Dhamma things, which is in the future? Uh, yeah, when are you going to attain Nibbana anyway? Yeah? It's way down the track. Yeah? Sensual pleasures, uh, they are available right now. But this, all this Dhamma stuff is way in the future. Yeah? And so he thinks and he, and he answers this day. He says that, uh, no, he says it's the other way around. Uh, it is the Dhamma that is available right here now, and essential pleasures uh, that are in the future. Yeah? And this day he says, oh, I don't understand what you're talking about. <laughs> what do you mean? And then he uh, suddenly says, well, I'm not entirely sure myself what this means. So uh, follow me along and I will go to the Buddha. And when we go to the Buddha, then both of us will listen to his answer to this conundrum. Uh, and then, then they go to the Buddha. And I'll stop the story there, but because it's not so interesting what happens afterwards. Uh, but that whole idea is very, very interesting. Yeah, The Dhamma is what it, 
it sounds like what the deity is saying is kind of right, yeah? The Dhamma, we're pursuing something that maybe we'll attain or achieve sometime in the future. You know? Where essential pleasures, they are available right now, just go and have lunch, yeah? whatever, you, you know that they are available to you. Yeah? So it kind of sounds right. Yeah? And I remember I was, uh, was funny, I, was, uh, I traveled too much, unfortunately, but I was in Indonesia a number of years ago, before COVID, I didn't travel much during COVID, but before that, uh, and I was giving a talk, and I told this story, because I tell the same stories every time I do retreats. So. <laughs> and I said that to the, this crowd, I told the story of Samidhi and the Devata, and then I said to the crowd, who was right, the Devata or Samidhi? And this young man on the front bench raised out, yeah, the Devata is right. <laughs> <laughs> and I think he was just joking, right? we were just having a good time, so it was kind of nice. But, uh, and, uh, but of course, the, it, the answer here is that uh, when we're dealing with sensual pleasures, uh, it always has to do with craving. Uh, it always has to do with future. Uh, it always has to do with looking for something else, looking for something more beyond what we have now. It is very rare that the mind is free of craving uh, when we are involved with the sensory world. Uh, and when the mind is free of craving in that sensory realm, we feel like dull, tired, pointless, right? Uh, there's nothing really there. Uh, when you eat your food, if you notice when you're eating your food, uh, you're kind of eating one spoon or one fork, uh, and while you're eating that one, you're already looking to the next one, right? Uh, this is what the sensory world is like. Uh, you're, even while you're enjoying it, uh, you're already looking forward to the next one. Uh, so you can't even enjoy it. What are you having? Uh, yeah, this is kind of the problem with this. Uh, but the Dhamma is very different. Uh, the Dhamma, when you do an act of kindness or generosity, you look after somebody, uh, you, you do yeah, whatever it might be. Uh, the moment you do that act of kindness, uh, it feels good right there and then. Uh, yeah? Straight away you get a boost uh, from doing an act of kindness. If it is a really a genuine act of kindness, uh, it does something to you. Uh, and if you notice the quality of the happiness that comes from that, uh, it is a different kind of quality. Uh, it doesn't have that craving with it. Uh, it actually makes you peaceful. Huh? So this is the idea of the difference between the Dhamma and the sensory world. Uh, even though it appears that all of the sensory world is available to you all the time, uh, in fact it is not, because it is always involves craving, uh, always involves going somewhere else, moving towards something more. Uh, it never has the satisfaction of the Dhamma, which is then uh, can be had right away here and now, if you practice in the right way. Huh? So it's one of those little paradoxes, yeah? It's like the, the, koans, the koans of early Buddhism. Uh, this, this are kind of the, as close as you get to koans in early Buddhism. Uh. There's a few more like that in the suttas that are really kind of paradoxes that are then explained by the Buddha. So this is the idea that it is immediately effective, uh, yeah? Apparent in the present life. Sanditika. Sanditika is the opposite of samparaika. Samparaika means regarding future lives, yeah? rebirth. So this is how we know that Sanditika must mean relating to this life. Uh, and Akalika is often used as a synonym for that in the suttas. Uh, inviting inspection, yeah? ehi pasiko. Uh, and uh, come and see, quite literally. Uh, so practice and see for yourself is again almost synonymous with the previous ones. Uh, see the results of this path. Uh, <coughs> then we have relevant. Relevant is uh, upanayaka, and uh, nayaka means something that kind of uh, is a kind of something that leads somewhere, it's going somewhere, and upa is like towards, uh, so going towards something, yeah, and uh, so relevant is uh, probably not wrong translation, but something like another translation that I have seen that is very nice is the idea of worthy of pursuit, it's quite a nice one because it is going somewhere or leading onward, or worthy of pursuit, or something like that. Uh, these are uh, acceptable, and I think quite good translations for Upanayaka. Huh? This is really worthwhile. Huh? This Dhamma actually does take you, take you somewhere really, uh, really interesting here. Yeah. And then we have the last one, the, so that sensible people can know it for themselves. Huh? Yeah, sensible people. Here is vinyu. Vinyu means there's so many words that mean like wise in the suttas. So you can't use wise for every one of these words. So he, he has he said sensible people instead of wise people. But uh, basically, you are wise. If you are wise enough, then you can see the Dhamma for yourself. 
So these are the ideas about uh, the Dhamma. Yeah, it is. Uh, these are the qualities, uh, and I'm not going to spend much more time on it. Uh, but uh, the way to, of course, really get into this uh, is to read it and to start to get the feeling for these teachings. Uh, and uh, the way to read the suttas, uh, if you are into reading the suttas, uh, is to read whatever you enjoy. Uh, yeah, if you don't enjoy a sutta, skip it. Don't enjoy the next one, skip that one. Don't like the next one, skip that one. Even if you read only one sutta in all of the 152 suttas of the Majjhima that's good enough. Uh, yeah, that will give you already some good grounding in the word of the Buddha. So read what you enjoy. This is number one uh, recommendation. Uh, don't read it as a textbook. Start on page one, finish on text, uh, page 1563, whatever it is. Uh, there's a lot of pages in some of these books. Uh, yeah, because that's not the point of the Dhamma. And uh, many suttas, they will teach you pretty much the same thing from slightly different angles. Uh, some of them you will enjoy, some of them you will not enjoy. Yeah? And so read what you, what you like. Yeah? And uh, so that is the problem. If you don't enjoy reading the suttas at all, that's also okay. Don't read them if you don't enjoy them. Uh, yeah? Because it just becomes a negative experience uh, that becomes damaging. So don't, don't give up straight away. Come back again in three months' time. Try again. And another three months' time. Try again. Uh, and one day, suddenly, you start enjoying these things. Uh. So uh, that is the Dhamma. These are the teachings that have the potential to lead you to the uh, out of suffering, uh, to the highest happiness that can be experienced by human beings. Uh, so extraordinary teachings. Uh. Yeah, and this is kind of why they are so worthy of respect uh, and why you understand that in your hands, when you have one of these Dhamma books in your hands, uh, it's like ha having a gold mine in your hands. Uh, yeah? All the wealth you could ever want in your life uh, is found in these teachings. Uh, they are kind of that extraordinary. Uh, and uh, so when you hold, when you kind of get your hands on one of these Majjhimanikaya books, you, if you tremble a little bit as you hold that book, uh, that is just what it should be like. Yeah? You should be trembling a little bit when you hold one of these gold mines in your hand. It's like people tremble because they have a valuable diamond in their hand. No need to tremble for the diamond. Mm -hmm. Tremble instead for the Majjhima far more valuable than these diamonds. So that is the Dhamma for you. So now let us go on to the next one, which is the recollection of the Sangha. Uh, furthermore, a noble disciple recollects the Sangha. The Sangha of the Buddha's disciples is practicing the way that is good, direct, systematic and proper. It consists of the four pairs, the eight individuals. This is the Sangha of the Buddha's disciples that is worthy of offerings dedicated to the gods, worthy of hospitality, worthy of religious donation, worthy of greetings with joint palms, and is a supreme field of merit for the world. And when you recollect the Sangha in this way, your mind is not full of greed, hatred and delusion. In this case, it is a straight. It is unswerving, as it says above, finding inspiration in the meaning and in the teaching, find joy connected with the teaching. When the joyful rapture springs up, when the mind is full of rapture, the body becomes tranquil. When the body is tranquil, they feel bliss. And when they are blissful, their mind becomes still. This is called a noble disciple who lives in balance among people who are unbalanced, lives in untroubled among people who are troubled. They've entered the stream of the teaching and they develop recollection of the Sangha. So here we have the Sangha and uh, it starts off by saying how they are practicing. Remember we are dealing with the noble ones here, the noble people. And so they are practicing the good practice, yeah? supatipanno, practicing the good way. They are well practiced, so to speak. Yeah? And um, yeah, well practiced, what does that mean? It just, I guess it means they're practicing that which works, yeah, they're well practiced. They're not practicing silly things, and they're practicing that which actually has an effect in the long run and the short run. Yeah? It is direct here, there's Ujju Patipano. And Ujju, as I've mentioned before, is this idea of straight. So they're practicing the straight path. They're not kind of deviating, they're not going on the crooked path, but they go on the direct way. 
And of course, the reason they are doing that is because they have seen the Dhamma. They know what the Dhamma is. Uh, they have the insight of the Buddha. So they don't deviate from the path. Uh, yeah, they always go in the right direction. Uh, and if they deviate marginally, it's a very, very short term until they kind of get the mindfulness back. The mindfulness is always on the Dhamma. This is this idea again of mindfulness also having to do with recollection and memory. The memory is there, imprinted in the mind, so powerful, you know, because that's what an awakening experience is. It's a kind of an imprinting on the mind. It's so powerfully imprinted you know, that it, they carry it with them all the time. That's why they never really go wrong. Ujju patipano, straight path. Whereas for most people who are not kind of areas, our path is more like like this, yeah? And sometimes it comes backwards and then it goes forwards again and it kind of goes in all kinds of angles. Uh, yeah, and that is to be expected. Uh, it's to be expected that sometimes you forget about these teachings and they go backwards. The idea here is to avoid going backwards uh, as much as possible. Uh, always taking two steps forward and a, a kind of, not even one step back, like half a step back or a tenth of a step back, as little as possible walking backwards. A little bit of walking backwards is unavoidable, uh, but you want to minimize it. Uh, and this is what you do by the idea of uh, brainwashing, right? It's the idea that you, it, you kind of, you really insert these teachings in your mind to such an extent uh, that you very rarely forget what you're supposed to do. You don't even think wrong thoughts anymore. That's kind of the idea behind this. Uh, so you become almost like a stream actor. You become not quite Ujjupatipano, but uh, what is almost Ujjupatipano? Um, just thinking about Pali for almost, not sure what it would be anyway, that doesn't matter. So uh, there is no term for that in the suttas, this will be uh, our sub-comment or commentary on the suttas, uh, the almost uh, straight path practitioner. So you practice the straight path because you are a stream entry. We are trying to emulate that. Uh, then it has here the idea of uh, practicing, uh, uh, where are we here? Systematically, yeah, the way that is systematic. And this is an interesting term, nyaya patipano. And nyaya is related to the word neti, which means to lead. And it seems to mean something like method or system or something like that. And in the suttas, the system that is talked about is always dependent origination and dependent cessation. So you are practicing according to dependent origination and according to dependent cessation. You are affecting the dependent cessation sequence. And yeah, that's what you're doing as a stream entry. Yeah. Until you have that insight into the nature of the world reality, you see the problem of a sense of self and you abandon that. Before that, we're always stuck in samsara. We're not really practicing for cessation yet. We're still on this treadmill going round and round and round. But once you see that, then you are on the path to cessation. You will cease eventually. So you're practicing the way of cessation at that particular point. So you're moving towards the ending of things at all times. Why? Because you have already fatally undermined avidja. Avidja is the ignorance or delusion at the beginning of dependent origination. And because that is fatally undermined, gradually all the factors of dependent origination will gradually become diminished and eventually cease. I don't know if you are all familiar with dependent origination. It's, uh, dependent origination, it's a very nice teaching. It's a teaching in 12 kind of steps, and they're all linked together. And it shows the arising of suffering, how suffering is ultimately rooted in ignorance or delusion. That's really what it is about. So that's why our job on the Buddhist path is to eliminate ignorance or delusion. Yeah? And of course, that is exactly what the Noble Eightfold Path does. We always talk about samadhi and these deep states of meditation. And of course, their purpose is to give rise to seeing things in accordance with reality, yata buddha and anadasana, which is the opposite of delusion and, and these things. So, um, dependent origination is a very beautiful sequence and it shows how delusion transforms into suffering. If you are deluded, you will suffer, guaranteed. That is what it shows you. And... Uh, so the stream mantra then has uh, seen through that uh, first link, the delusion, and because of that, uh, uh, instead of originating suffering, we now go into the cessation modus of that sequence, uh, which means that we are ceasing suffering, yeah, gradually, stage by stage, uh, through these 12 links. Uh, so this is Nyaya Patipano, you are on the cessation uh, path uh, 
to all of these things. Uh, and what is it that ceases? Uh, number one that ceases is suffering. Yeah. That's really all you need. That's good enough, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Uh, I, um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's interesting because people often wonder, oh, what does it mean to be an arahant? What does it mean when the arahant dies? What is actually going on there? I want to know exactly what happens. Uh, and what happens is that suffering ceases. Uh, yeah. I, I think that's Fine, yeah, that's kind of all we need to know sometimes, because sometimes if you try to understand things that are so profound, you tend to misconstrue it. Uh, it makes, but suffering ceasing, everyone can understand that. Uh, highest happiness, everyone can maybe understand that, I'm not sure, but maybe. Uh, so, that is the idea a bit behind systematic. Uh, then we have the way that is proper. Uh, this is the Samichi Patipano, and it uh, means basically means proper in the word. Uh, it is you're supposed to behave properly towards other people. That's actually samichi. Yeah. So uh, it's the proper way. Yeah. It's just an, another adjective that uh, kind of drives home the point here. Yeah. And uh, so this is uh, kind of nice, right? This is the, what the path is about. Give us an idea of this path they're practicing. Yeah. And uh, you are only fully on the path when you become a stream mentor. Before that, we are trying our best to follow along. Yeah. Uh, Successful most of the time, but not always. Uh. And it consists of the four pairs, the eight individuals. Uh, someone asked a question about that yesterday during the Q&A. Uh, and so the, uh, f uh, these eight individuals are the um, stream mentor, the once returned, non returned, and the arahant, uh, uh, the perfected one, and then those on the path to those attainments. Uh, I guess two, two times four is eight. Uh, I still haven't forgotten all my maths from the... Um, <laughs> from the early years, a long time ago. Huh? So, um, yeah, so these are the four pairs. And these, all the, the reason they are called the noble individuals uh, is because they have the same insight as the Buddha has. Uh, yeah? So anyone who is part of these four pairs uh, has the ability to teach the Dhamma, much like the Buddha did. Uh, yeah, they have that right insight. Uh, so these are the teachers in the world. These are the people we should listen to. Ideally, we should look out for noble people that, who have that ability to, um, to um, pass on the Dhamma in the right way. So this is the Sangha of the Buddhist disciple, worthy of offerings dedicated to the gods. <laughs> I've never seen this translation before. It's a very interesting translation. And um, I think what is going on here is that the word, the Pali word behind this, ahuneya, uh, usually refers to gifts to the gods, yeah? Because all of these words existed in India prior to Buddhism. And so it was used as donations to the gods. Uh. But now the, these noble individuals, uh, they have kind of taken the place of the gods, uh, right? Uh, we're saying before that the Buddha is the teacher of gods and humans. Uh, and because all of these noble individuals have the same kind of insight as the Buddha, uh, they are also, in a way, teachers of gods and humans. Uh. So those donations that you previously gave to the gods, uh, you should now give to the noble ones instead. Uh, yeah? That's kind of the idea here. Uh, because the idea of who is worthy of uh, support has changed uh, yeah? once you have these uh, people arising in the world. Uh, so they become almost like the new... No, I shouldn't say that sounds, that sounds wrong. Uh, anyway, so th this is kind of the idea here, I think, behind this expression. It's a little bit... Uh, Unusual, I've never seen anyone else translate it in that way, but that's nice to have some alternative translations. So, um, so they are worthy of offerings dedicated to the gods, worthy of hospitality, again, because these are the great teachers in the world. These are the teachers that can lead you on the right track. These are the ones that will not lead you astray. Anyone who does not have the full insight into the Dhamma will quite likely, at some point, lead you astray. So you have to somehow try to discern who these people are. It can be really hard, really difficult to discern who these people are. Some of the most famous monks in the world, in my opinion, are not Aryas, not noble ones. Super duper famous, very well known, worshipped or respected by many as fully enlightened. But when I look at them, I think, I don't think so. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? Because I guess we all are a bit like that. We disagree a bit on who is, has, the, has the awakening experience, who hasn't. It can be very hard to discern. 
But uh, so that's why we have to look very carefully here, yeah? and we should not stop superficially here. Yeah? yeah, at things. Uh, so uh, be careful. It's very easy to project attainments onto people. Yeah? Someone may be a good speaker here. Yeah? They may seem very together. They may seem very good person in so many ways. Uh, but actually, depth of insight is very profound. It's very hard to discern that in someone. Yeah? So. Um, they are worthy of uh, hospitality, right? Because these are the teachers, just like I mentioned before. Any, anyone who is a really good teacher, they give you access to things that otherwise you would not have access to. And so they are given something in return. Yeah, that kind of makes sense. Uh, worthy of religious donation, it's just uh, more of the same, really. Uh, and worthy of greetings with joined palms, Anjali Karaniyo. Anjali is the famous Indian gesture that you see in India, putting your palms together here. And this is kind of well known in the Buddhist world, but it really comes from Indian culture. Here. That's where it originally derives from. Here. And it's like the equivalent to the handshake in the Western world, pretty, pretty much. Yeah? Maybe it's a bit more formal than the handshake, but it's very close to that. Anjali is done between equals, and it's also done to show respect. So it has a both, uh, kind of both of those things. Yeah. So, uh, that's why we do Anjali towards the Buddha and these kind of things. And they are the supreme field of merit for the world. Yeah, it, this means that if you uh, give a, if you want to do an offering to someone and you do it towards a group of people where there are noble ones, uh, well, that's usually that's considered the higher kind of offering, yeah, and it has better results as a consequence. So that is the uh, the sangha and. Um, Sometimes I would really recommend you to meet some of these people if possible, to meet people who are different, uh, who have like a uh, ability to inspire you in a different way, where you get a feeling that there is some profundity and depth to these people. Uh, and sometimes you get this feeling that there's something special about someone. It's not eye-opener when you see that, uh, because we're used to seeing ordinary people in the world, uh, and uh, it is not usually pretty kind of uninspiring. Yeah? It's not really all that interesting very often. Uh, we see defilements, we see problems, we see all these kind of things. Uh, and then suddenly one day you see someone who has endless patience, uh, someone who has kindness almost at all times, uh, someone who never shows any anger. Uh, and when you see that, it opens up your eyes to another world, another possibility. Uh, you realize that the Dhamma is not just a theoretical framework, the Dhamma is real, it actually has these kind of results. And so I have to admit, I enjoy meeting people sometimes. I mean, I already have Ajahn Brahm, so I feel extraordinarily fortunate to sit next to him, and he's always there, and he has, to my mind, uh, you check it out yourself, what you think, but to my mind he has some of these qualities. Uh, it's kind of quite extraordinary. Uh, but there are other people as well uh, who have these things. Uh, so sometimes it can be really inspiring to meet some of these people and get this feeling that there is something more in the world. And what a wonderful thing that is. Because if there is no nothing more in the world, it means that things like climate change and war in Ukraine and all of these problems we have, yeah, the uh, tsunamis, whatever it is, all of these problems become much more real. There isn't really any escape from those problems anymore. Yeah. But the moment there is something more in the world, the moment there is a spiritual path, uh, there's a possibility of going beyond the ordinary five sense world, uh, at that moment it opens up something very beautiful. Uh, and what a wonderful thing that is when that actually uh, that happens. Uh, it gives you a sense of hope. It gives you a sense that uh, the world is far more interesting uh, than you thought it was uh, before. Uh. So, uh, yeah, anyway, that's what... Uh, one of the things that has inspired me uh, in my life, uh, it was very interesting because I started out my monastic life here in the UK actually, uh, and I kind of st stayed in some of these monasteries, uh, but I had the experience of just hearing one talk by Ajahn Brahm, uh, or actually reading a talk by him, uh, and straight away I knew this is my teacher. It was really powerful. Uh, and so I called him up in Australia, I never spoken to him before, he had never spoken, no idea who I was. I just called and said, hello Ajahn Brahm, can I come to Australia? He said, sure, I get on the plane, I went to Australia. It was, that's how it worked, yeah, it's really random. That's how I ended up in Australia. So um, anyway, so that is the Sangha for you, yeah? Um, and uh, recalling these people, and sometimes that recollection becomes more powerful if you know some of these people, but even just the idea of the Sangha is already a, 
a beautiful one here. So now let's go on to the last uh, recollections here. Yeah. Um, the next one is the recollection of one's ethical conduct. And it goes as follows. Uh, Furthermore, a noble disciple recollects their own ethical conduct, uh, which is unbroken, impeccable, spotless and unmarred, liberating, praised by sensible people, not mistaken, and leading to samadhi, to stillness. Uh, and then you have the same thing, when a noble disciple recollects their ethical conduct, uh, their mind is not full of greed, hatred and delusion. Uh, at that time their mind is straight, uh, based on, the, uh, on their ethical conduct. Uh, a noble disciple whose mind is straight finds inspiration and in the meaning and the teaching, uh, and finds joy connected with the teaching. Uh, when they're joyful, rapture comes. When you're raptured, you become tranquil. When you're tranquil, you have bliss. When you have bliss, uh, you have stillness uh, of the mind. So, uh, right there you can see the connection. And this is one of the reasons I was talking before about the importance of sila nusati, uh, the idea of recollecting your virtue. Uh, this is what it does to you. Uh, if it works properly, uh, it actually gives rise to samadhi, it gives rise to one of these foundational things that is so necessary on the path, to make the path work fully. Uh, so uh, it has a very powerful effect. Uh, so let's just uh, look at some of these qualities that are talked about here, what they actually mean. So we can see the importance here of having conduct that is really pure, right? We have all of these words that make the, basically mean the same thing. Unbroken, impeccable, spotless, unmarred. They're all pointing to the fact that you want to be as pure as you possibly can in your ethical conduct. And the more pure it is, and here, of course, we have the purity of the stream enter. You want to, again, try to emulate that to the best of your ability. Uh, once, the more pure it is, the more power it has in affecting this kind of, giving this kind of effect, yeah, that you can actually be joyful about it, because you know that you are living well. You, it's kind of becoming obvious to you. Uh, and uh, then this kind of, this process happens as a consequence. Uh, and please remember again that uh, Ethical conduct in Buddhism is about certainly avoiding the bad things, also doing the good things. Yeah, Do good things in your life uh, whenever you have the chance. Uh, remember that it also has to do with your mental conduct, uh, right? Uh, yeah, thinking about things in the right way, uh, um, looking at people either with loving kindness or compassion, uh, at worst with equanimity. Uh, yeah, equanimity sometimes might be requ required in certain s circumstances, uh, but um, uh, you're never really getting angry or having ill will towards others uh, because uh, actually uh, it is not really uh, it is not really useful at all in fact it is very detrimental for everyone uh. and so when you take virtue uh, that seriously uh, you can imagine that when you sit down to do your meditation uh, it's going to work right because you have all of this purity inside uh. your mind is already leaning very strongly in the right direction meditation just happens as a consequence so uh. So um, you want to make it as strong as possible. Of course, if you do make a mistake, if your virtue is broken, then you try to uh, forgive yourself by understanding the conditionality in your life, the strong tendencies we all have. Of course, everyone is going to make mistakes, so you are going to make mistakes. Uh, then you learn to forgive yourself by understanding how trapped you are by the past conditions of the past. Uh, but uh, be careful. Again, as I think I mentioned before, remember that uh, uh, you cannot forgive yourself 100%, uh, right? Forgiveness, there's always going to be a residue of self-blame usually in these things. Uh, and that is because the sense of self is still there. As long as you're not a stream entry, as long as you haven't seen the Dhamma properly, uh, the sense of self will always worm itself, so, uh, itself into your psychology and the way you deal with things. Uh, and so you will always have some degree of self-blame when you make a mistake. Uh, and that is why it is, you cannot just forgive yourself and do all kind of crazy things, that doesn't work. You actually have to live to the best of your ability at the same time. The two combined becomes very powerful. Forgiveness and then virtue to the best of your ability. Then you're on the right track. The danger always when we talk about being really virtuous is that people become upset with themselves if they fail. Right? They 
put the bar very high, and when you put the bar very, very high, it is very easy to get angry with, oh, I'm failing in my virtue. And uh, that, of course, is not a good idea also. So we need this balance between, on the one hand, setting the bar high, but also knowing that you will fail at times. And when you have that knowledge beforehand, uh, because you know how conditioned you are, uh, then you will be able to forgive yourself when you make a mistake. Uh. So always forgive yourself. Uh. Always know that this is just a conditioned process. And actually, when you forgive yourself, uh, it actually improves your ability to be virtuous afterwards. Uh. Because when you blame yourself, uh, you're kind of just getting into unwholesome states that cloud the mind in a bad way. Uh, and it will actually reduce your ability to be kind and do the right thing here. So get these things right, uh, and then uh, you, it's going to work out really nicely usually. Uh. Yes? Uh, when you say that uh, you're not going to be able to do anything, okay, so unmind, liberating, right, the fact that virtue liberates you, it sets you free. Uh, uh, sometimes people think that not being virtuous sets you free because you can do what you want. Uh, but you enter another prison. You are free from a, uh, you are free from one prison, but you enter another far worse prison uh, by uh, not being virtuous. And I think probably most of you understand that uh, because that's why you are here, presumably. Uh, and that is the prison of the mind. Where well, the mind is in a terrible state. Uh, the mind is going into darkness. The mind is going into a sense of self-reproach and self-blame. Uh, uh, because and that, that sense of prison is far, far worse uh, than the prison of having to restrain your worst impulses uh, and living well there. Uh. So it actually is liberating here. Uh. So it liberates you right here and now, and it also liberates you in the long run through the practice of the path. Uh. It is praised by sensible people, yeah? If you, I don't know who you would like to be praised by, but uh, if praised by people who are wise, uh, yeah? So wise people praise you, uh, and that's kind of nice, uh, yeah? Imagine the Buddha saying, yeah, yeah you, you're doing the right thing, well then, carry on. Uh, something like that. Uh, and uh, that's kind of nice if the Buddha praises you, or if people who are generally wise in the world. Uh, yeah? When Ajahn Brahm says something to me, I usually listen. When other people say something to me, I think whatever. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm exaggerating here. Yeah. Please don't take everything I say too seriously, otherwise it's going to be very problematic. Yeah. I try to take what everyone says seriously, but of course, when someone like Ajahn Brahm speaks to you, it has an extra impact. Uh, and, and the reason it has an impact, because I always feel that he has my best interest at heart when he speaks to me. Uh, There's a sense that it's not coming from his defilement, so he wants to control me or anything like that. It's actually coming from kindness. Uh, and uh, it is always like that, right? The people we want to be praised by are the people who are good people in the world. Uh, if some scallywag praises you, then uh, you kind of <laughs> it's, you almost wonder whether it's kind of backhanded, whether it's a bad thing that they praise you. You probably did something bad to deserve praise from a scallywag. Yeah. So you think, oh, okay, better be careful here. Yeah. But in general, don't seek praise in the world. Uh, yeah, people want praise, uh, but actually most of the praise that we get is shallow. Uh, and uh, very often it's meaningless. Uh, and very often it's got nothing to do with the spiritual part. People praise you for all kinds of things that are utterly irrelevant. Uh, so be careful to becoming someone who is looking for praise in the world, because actually it doesn't mean very much. And once you can overcome the attachment to being praised, well, it, what happens then is that you also, at the same time, you also overcome the attachment to blame, because they go, go, they go together. If you don't take the praise so seriously, you won't take the blame so seriously either. People blame you, you just shrug your shoulders, okay, they blame me, and you look into it, have, have they got a point? Okay, they got a point. Okay, in that case, I make some amends. Have they not got a point? Okay, forget about it. Most of the time when people blame you, they haven't really got a point uh, because people blame you for all kinds of uh, uh, reasons that are not really, nothing to do with Dhamma or truth or whatever. Uh. So letting go of praise and blame actually is one of those uh, great things. Uh, and then when someone really praises you who's really wise uh, or really said something, then you really listen. Uh, uh, because then it, it obviously must be some reason for it. Uh, it's interesting, someone like Ajahn Brahm, he doesn't really play, praise or blame you very much. Uh, yeah, he, he never blames you. Occasionally he might praise you. Uh, and uh, that's kind of nice. Yeah? It is not about praise and blame. It's about treating people with a sense of uh, heartfelt concern and kindness. Uh, that is what is profound and deep. Uh, praise and blame is often superficial uh, and often used to control people. Uh, and uh, that is kind of uh, unpleasant. Uh,
So praised by the wise, yeah, that kind of conduct is praised by the wise. Uh, not mistaken, the, this is a wrong translation as far as I'm concerned, uh, it means not grasped, uh, yeah? You don't grasp this, this uh, virtue. Why? Because you are a noble person at this point. Uh, and noble people, there's no need to grasp the virtue because they are. It's kind of imprinted in the psyche, so they cannot actually be anything but virtuous. So. Whereas for those people who are not noble, well, we actually we need to grasp it a little bit. Uh, because otherwise, as I mentioned yesterday, it doesn't really work out. Uh, so this means it is not grasped. Uh, but please grasp a little bit, uh, because that will lead you in the right way. Uh, and then it leads to samadhi, it leads to stillness. Uh, and this is one of these things that again, you see again and again in the suttas, uh, that the foundations for all meditation, whether it's satipatthana or samadhi, everything is always virtue, 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 kindness, 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 uh, throughout, again and again and again. Uh, and here you have it one more time. Uh, and then after a while, it starts to sink in how important this is uh, and why every moment of your life should be dedicated to this kind of practice uh, and why every moment of your life is an opportunity to move towards the goals of this path, towards samadhi itself. Uh, yeah, and as you, uh, you can start to feel how incredibly important it is, uh, and then uh, you uh, take one step forward, another step forward, another step forward, you don't take any steps back anymore. Uh, it leads to immersion. Uh, and of course, once you get to immersion or samadhi, you are also very close to insight. Uh. So this is the idea of recollecting your virtue. So you, first of all, you purify it as much as you can because you understand how incredibly important it is. You don't want to waste the opportunity. You have this life now, and now is the opportunity. Before you know it, you're going to be dead. It happens so fast. So take this opportunity so you don't regret it later on. And then, as you do that, then when you sit down and you meditate, very often you don't really have to recall it very much. It's like it is so much part of you, the idea of living well, that you just feel good about yourself automatically. Yeah. So when you watch the breath or whatever meditation that you do, yeah, and then the goodness is just there inside of you. Yeah, yeah and it kind of comes with the territory here, yeah, and you feel naturally uplifted yeah, because you have lived well. Some have lived well. Sometimes you can't, maybe not even able to pinpoint exactly why it is that you feel good about yourself, why you feel a sense of self-worth, why you have all of these feelings. Yeah. You cannot pinpoint it, but when you kind of stop, sometimes you get that insight, oh, it's because I'm living well that I feel all these positive feelings. Uh, so you, generally you just feel this, but sometimes you can also encourage yourself. And sometimes these are reflections that you can do also outside of meditation. Uh, and just a reminder to yourself that by living virtuously, uh, you're actually giving a massive gift to the world around you. Uh, I mentioned this before about the five precepts or whatever, yeah, you're no longer cheating anyone, no longer killing anyone, uh, and you are giving freedom from fear in the world. Uh. But if you live with kindness, you're doing much more than that. Uh. When people feel your kindness in their life, uh, actually, it is very powerful for other people. Uh. Yeah, you're giving them also, you're giving them a, a hope for the world, you're giving them a sense of uplift because you are kind to them. Uh. They will feel really happy when, when people treat them with kindness. Uh, I don't know, there are certain times in my life when people have treated me with kindness out of the blue. And I thought, wow, that's really so nice. It is so refreshing and it's so kind of, uh, it really gives an uplift in your mind. It, things happen to you that you really never expected would happen. Uh, and uh, it's such a beautiful thing. It has this kind of uh, repercussions, yeah, like, uh, like, um, uh, it spreads out like waves into the world uh, and it touches other people and they get touched and they touch someone else and it spreads out like this. Uh, and uh, every time you speak to someone, every time you do an act, you have a potentially, you can touch someone's heart. Uh, you're giving them a gift. Uh, when you touch someone's heart, you're awakening positive emotions in them. Uh, that is the gift we can give to people around us almost all the time. Uh, it's really powerful, and very often you won't see it, because people won't show it, right? Because it's very personal. They won't show those emotions, uh, and they will just carry on. Uh, but I guarantee you that it works. Uh, it is there, and it's a very beautiful thing to do. Huh? So, please do that, uh, and know that it has effect in the world around you. Huh? And when you start to know the effect in the world around you, huh, of course you start to feel very, even more happy about it, uh, because you know that you are not only 
uplifting your own life, you're uplifting the life of kind of the world in general there. And that's kind of marvelous when that happens. Uh. So reflect on these things in this way. Uh. And then when you close your eyes, uh, you get this gentle sense of satisfaction inside of you, uh, contentment, uh, because you're living well. Uh. Again, it's not about the ego, it's about this beautiful spiritual quality inside her. Uh. So um, this is the idea of uh, reflecting on your uh, uh, spiritual uh, qualities in terms of uh, uh, virtue and kindness and morality. It may also be that at times you can think of uh, specific acts that you have done, uh, things that had a really powerful impact on you, uh, and you can bring those back into the present, uh, and then you will maybe re-experience some of those powerful feelings you had before. Uh, these are various ways that these things work. And, and sometimes you have to kind of figure out what works best for you. Let's go, let's go on, because uh, there's still a lot to, to be done. Actually, not a lot to be done. That's kind of a, that's a bit silly, isn't it? We just do whatever we can. So that's kind of the reality. So relax. <laughs> so next, now we come to the recollection of generosity. And uh, it goes as follows. Furthermore, a noble disciple recollects their own generosity. I am so fortunate, so very fortunate, uh, among the people full of the stain of stinginess. Uh, I live at home rid of stinginess, uh, freely generous, uh, open-handed, loving to let go, committed to charity, loving to give and to share. When a noble disciple collects their own generosity, their mind is not full of greed, hate and delusion etc., etc., you feel the joy and it takes you all the way to Samadhi once more. Uh, this is called the noble disciple who lives in balance among people who are unbalanced, uh, who lives on trouble among people who are troubled, uh, and they have entered the stream of the teaching and developed the recollection of generosity. Uh, this is called Chaga Nusati in Pali. Uh, yeah, chaga is like giving up and letting go of things. Uh, and I just find the beginning here, this is so Beautiful, uh, yeah. This this idea is so different from what you would hear among worldly people. Uh, I am so fortunate, so very fortunate, uh, that uh, among people who have the stains of stinginess, uh, I live at home rid of the stain of stinginess. Uh, right? You feel lucky that you are a generous person. Uh, you feel, wow, I'm so lucky to have this uh, inclination in my mind, uh, this kind of propensity to give and share. Uh, what a wonderful thing that is. And because you understand the power of these spiritual qualities, you understand that the person who benefits the most from charity and generosity is actually you, not the recipient, but the doer is the one who benefits the most. And once you see that, well then you can really say, I'm so fortunate, so very fortunate. And then you take every opportunity in your life to be generous. Wherever you feel that your mind inclines, wherever you feel a sense of compassion, whenever you think, oh, now I want to give. If ever you want to give, give before your rational mind says, no, it's not really worthy here. <laughs> because it is that inclination of the heart, yeah? when, the, when really you are turning towards, you feel this urge inside, uh, that is when it leaves a powerful imprint on the mind. Uh, because your mindfulness is strong, you are enjoying what you're doing. Uh, when mindfulness is strong and you are enjoying what you're doing, it leaves an imprint in the mind uh, that later on you can then uh, bring out again and use in your meditation practice. Uh, so if you ever feel that you want to give it to any cause, whatever it is, uh, give when the feeling arises. Uh, it does not have to be a Buddhist cause. Uh, it doesn't have to be anything specific. Uh, yeah, it can be whatever, uh, whoever at any particular time when the uh, desire and the feeling arises in this way. Uh, and um, so this is kind of uh, having an understanding for the idea of generosity. Uh, and in many ways you can say that uh, Buddhism is built on these very simple building blocks uh, because most of our life we are not meditating, most of our life we are doing things in the world, uh, and so most of our life it is the virtue and the generosity that really runs our spiritual practice. Uh, this is what the spiritual practice is about in ordinary life. Uh, yeah, and uh, so here is a massive opportunity, and the idea is to take that opportunity whenever we can. Uh, to become like this one Anagarik I mentioned the other day, who kind of is always doing things in a monastery. And I, I, I was inspired by this Anagarika. I thought, wow, he's an Anagarika, and uh, he does 
<laughs> it's amazing what he does. I don't know if the most monks don't do this kind of degree of generosity and kindness. Uh, this Anagarika is kind of going beyond everyone else. Uh, what an inspiring person. Uh, and it's kind of interesting how we can get inspired by people in the world, anyone really. Uh, so whenever we see goodness, uh, we should allow ourselves to be inspired. It doesn't matter where we see it. Uh, and uh, this then transforms into our own acting in accordance with that. Uh, so you feel happy that you are generous, right? You know that the stinginess has left you, you're not stingy anymore. Uh, and uh, you are freely generous, uh, open-handed, loving to let go, uh, committed to charity, uh, loving to give and share. This idea that you just want to give. Uh, have you ever had that feeling in your life when you kind of your you get this feeling of your heart kind of opening up to the world uh, and you just want to give it to everyone? Uh, See, when that happens uh, occasionally, when that happens, it's like very, very beautiful. Uh, and you know that this idea of generosity, when it becomes strong, is a very powerful spiritual feeling. Uh, and you know exactly why it works in this way. Yeah? When you want to share everything with anyone, of course you can't do that because you, you're going to be living under a bridge somewhere in a cardboard box if you do that. But, uh, so keep a little bit for yourself. Uh, uh, but uh, you get this powerful sense of this importance of generosity and you just want to share with everyone in the whole world, whatever you can. Uh, and that is the kind of spiritual feeling that we're trying to move towards here. Uh, if you want to enter a deep state of samadhi, uh, According to the suttas, the only way you can do that is by having these kind of feelings. Uh, if you have any sense of stinginess, any sense of holding back, not giving completely, you cannot enter a state of samadhi, nor can you have the insight that leads to stream entry. Uh, they need this kind of complete letting go. Yeah? Everything in the world is yours. Uh, take it. Uh, I'll give it to you. Uh, and you know, of course, that by doing that, uh, you have something far deeper and more interesting for yourself. Uh, that doesn't make it selfish either. Yeah? Just because you know it is for your own good, it doesn't make it selfish yeah? because you're still letting go. Yeah? So this is kind of the idea of generosity. Take every opportunity. Give it to an animal. Yeah? Give it to the insects. Yeah? Some beautiful passages in the suttas that I often talk about in, in connection with generosity. One of those passages is, uh, you know, as a monk, after you've eaten your meal, yeah? there's a little bit of food left over, yeah? maybe just a few rice grains or whatever, yeah? And then you're at your hut in the forest uh, and you're washing a bowl. Uh, now you can either wash that bowl and just chuck out the bowl washing water, uh, or you can think, actually, I have an opportunity for generosity here. Uh, and you think, may these rice grains uh, be for the little insects in the grass. Uh, that change of perspective, tiny change, this doesn't change an attitude. You know, you're doing exactly the action is exactly the same. One is like uh, doesn't get you anywhere. Uh, the other one is a, is a spiritual action that will help you on the path. Uh, yeah? Or the kangaroos that are around. Uh, I often give food to the kangaroos when I, I'm at my cutie. I have it left over anyway. Uh, so it's there. And uh, you try to give them food that is not too dangerous for them. Uh, like fish bones. It's not a good idea to give fish bones to a kangaroo. They don't know how to eat fish. Yeah? They've never had fish before. So that's kind of dangerous for a kangaroo. Uh, and, um, so you uh, try to be wise about it. And you can see the kangaroos, yeah? When they get something special, wow, oh, they're so happy. Yeah? Chocolate cake, yeah? The <laughs> eyes light up. Wow, chocolate cake. Ooh. It's like, it's been, not very often they get chocolate cake as a kangaroo, so they're really happy, yeah? And it's, and it's wonderful to see that. Uh, and then you kind of, uh, and you kind of, so that your whole life becomes in a, a kind of a life of generosity, yeah? It becomes one of the main motives uh, uh, of your life, uh, this uh, idea of always kind of being supportive, in doing service, uh, doing acts of kindness. Uh. So uh, that is the uh, idea of generosity on the path. Uh. Let me quickly also go through the last one, uh, and uh, I don't know how meaningful this is going to be to you, maybe to some of you it is going to be meaningful, uh, uh, but this is the recollection of the deities. Uh. So furthermore, a noble disciple recollects the deities. They are gods of the four great kings, the gods of the 33, the gods of Yama, the joyful gods. I think it should be the contented gods, but anyway. The gods who love to create and the gods who control the creations of others. The gods of Brahma's host and the gods even higher than these. When those deities passed away from here, here means the human realm, they were reborn there because of their faith, ethics, 
learning, generosity and wisdom. I too have the same kind of faith, ethics, learning, generosity and wisdom. Yeah, so you realize you are practicing the path to being reborn in those deities. When a noble disciple recollects the faith, ethics, learning, generosity and wisdom of both themselves and the deities, their mind is not full of greed, hatred and delusion. At that time their mind is straight or unswerving based on the deities. A noble disciple whose mind is unswerving unswer finds inspiration in the meaning and the teaching here, and finds joy connected with the teaching here. When you're joyful, rapture springs up. When the mind is full of rapture, the body becomes tranquil. When the body is tranquil, you feel bliss. When you're blissful, the mind becomes stilled. This is called a noble disciple who lives in balance among people who are unbalanced, lives untroubled among people who are untroubled, and have entered the stream of the teaching and developed the recollection of the deities. So here, uh, this is uh, basically about just knowing, I mentioned this already, I think, earlier on in the retreat, or so, and that uh, uh, the idea here is that uh, the deities practiced in a certain way to get reborn there, and now you are practicing in the same way. So deities are not looked down upon in the suttas. They are seen as beings who have done many good things, and that's why they are reborn in those higher realms. They don't have the wisdom of the Buddha, but they have some kind of wisdom, right? They have some sort of right direction of their minds. And if we are not going to become enlightened, well, it at least is nice to become higher, something more than just human, right? After a life of human, okay, enough of being human. Now let's go to the next level at the very least. Do you agree with that? Yeah, might as well have a holiday in heaven and then kind of um, whatever that might be. And uh, because they are, and you can also imagine that because they have all of these qualities, uh, when you go to a heavenly realm, they will still have those qualities, yeah? So there will still be a lot of wisdom around, a lot of good things around. Uh, one of the obvious things about these heavenly realms, uh, if you are keen to meet noble people, noble deities, uh, noble beings, uh, people have an understanding of the teaching, uh, there's probably far more of them in the heavenly realms than there is uh, among humans. Uh, why? Because they are so, lo so long lived. Uh, so once you go there, and there, many of them would have been reborn there after the, uh, at the time of the Buddha and all the centuries afterwards, uh, and they're probably still there, right? Uh, so probably an accumulation of noble people, areas in the heavenly realms. Uh, you just have to go to the right corner of the heavenly realm. Uh, you are aware of that, right? Because the heavenly realm is like the human realm. It's the Christians are over here, the Muslims are over there, uh, <laughs> the atheists are there somewhere, and the Buddhists are there. So make sure you go to the Buddhist corner of heaven. Uh, <laughs> Because it's always like that, right? It's the same thing in the human realm. We tend to hang out with the people who are like us. Uh, so here we hang out with Buddhists. Uh, and, yeah? And so, uh, so that is uh, kind of uh, the way things... Uh, I think there's some truth to that, actually. Uh, there was a monk who said this a while ago. He said, yeah, when you go to heaven, the heaven has these kind of the various kind of quarters and things. So go, go to the right quarter. So, yeah, it is not... It is not bad to be a deity. Yeah. It is far superior to being a human being. Yeah. And at the very least, we are on the right track. And of course, the point is uh, that the path to becoming a deity is the same path as to become enlightened. It's the same qualities that are required. Uh, so it's not wasted in any case. Uh, and that is kind of the good thing about this. Uh. So that is the, uh, the six recollections, uh, and uh, I will leave it at that. Uh, so uh, uh, try them out and see if they can make them work for you in one way or another. Uh, use the ones that are make most sense to you. Uh, um, some of these may not work for you because they are just uh, you haven't got the uh, inclination of the mind or whatever. Uh, so try out a few different ones and see actually what you can make work. It becomes pretty obvious pretty quickly what is your kind of uh, strength, if you like. Uh, so please uh, carry on uh, and keep on enjoying yourself, of course, uh, and we'll be back again at 7 o'clock with some more meditation practice.